up on Cronkite News, a late night at the Capitol that turned into a bipartisan budget deal. Plus, period product shortage, how this supply chain issue is impacting people physically and mentally. And we're taking you behind the screens of some small businesses to learn how they've stayed alive through the pandemic. Cronkite News starts now. Good evening and welcome to Cronkite News on Arizona PBS. I'm Nikita Chaturvedi. And I'm Taylor Corlew. Thank you for joining us. In the early hours of the morning, state lawmakers finally passed the state budget bill. Included in the bill is funding for water infrastructure, border security, and education. Julio Mora Rodriguez is at the Capitol and spoke with state lawmakers to get their reaction. The eyes have it, a massive $18 billion budget was passed with senators and representatives from both sides of the aisle. The final bill allocates nearly $600 million in permanent school funding, $1 billion for water and infrastructure each, and more than $560 million for border security. Some local politicians hailed the bipartisan effort that got the bill through the Arizona House and Senate. Uh, I'm really proud of the negotiation process that took place over the last few days here at the Capitol. And again, I think the, it sends a strong message to all of Arizona in terms of how we can all work together to ensure that Arizona moves forward. But not all Democrats or Republicans were happy with the compromise budget. The core issue is that government is bloated, it's spending way too much, You're, the, the taxpayer isn't seeing a return on that investment, they're struggling, and they want their money back. And that's not being prioritized. Governor Ducey also weighed in on the first bipartisan bill passed under Ducey's tenure as governor, saying in a statement, with the FY23 budget, we're putting those dollars to good use and investing in priorities that Republicans and Democrats alike can agree on. It's no wonder this budget passed the legislature with large bipartisan support. With the passage of this budget, lawmakers are looking to end the legislative session for 2022 tonight or tomorrow. From the Capitol, Julio Mora Rodriguez, Cronkite News. There could soon be some relief at the pump. That's the request from the president to Congress. Daisy Gonzalez Perez in our Washington, D.C. bureau has this story and more. President Joe Biden made a call to Congress asking lawmakers to eliminate the federal gas tax, but not everyone is on board. Congress is reluctant to lower the gas tax. Members say it really depends on the states and the oil companies. Some states have had success in giving relief to consumers, but not all of them. A number of states have had gas tax linked to constitutional investments in the infrastructure, and there's no guarantee it would be passed to consumers. President Biden called out the oil companies recently over gas prices. My message is simple to the companies running gas stations and setting those prices at the pump. This is a time of war, global peril, Ukraine. These are not normal times. Bring down the price you are charging at the pump to reflect the cost you are paying for the product. Do it now. Do it today. Biden's call for an elimination on the tax isn't even favorable among most Democrats, and so far there has been no movement on the issue. You have the right to remain silent. We all know the classic turn of the phrase used throughout every scene in cinematic history. The Miranda warning is a statement given to suspects police plan to interrogate. In a 6-3 ruling yesterday, the Supreme Court decided that an officer violating the Miranda rules no longer violates a suspect's Fifth Amendment rights. The decision allows the government to use a suspect's unmirandized statements against them in court with little to no consequences. Exceptions for skipping the process were allowed in cases where public safety was at risk. The Miranda rights were first established in the historic 1966 Supreme Court case, Miranda v. Arizona. That's the latest from Washington, D.C. I'm Daisy gonzalez Bettis. Back to you, Taylor. Yet another shortage has hit stores. This time, it's feminine care products that are in short supply. Cronkite News reporter Milan Andrade tells us how the shortfall has led to renewed calls for what's known as period equity. Nonprofits across the U.S. work to ensure that feminine care products are accessible and affordable for all. But the latest supply chain shortage has them worried that donations will decrease and fewer people will get the help they need. Organizations such as Go With The Flow make sure students have access to period products here in Arizona. Yet another supply chain problem, a shortage of tampons, has the group worried it might not be able to help those who need it. 
we know that with students, one out of five students will end up missing school or class because of lack of access to period products. One out of four adult menstruators already has a difficult time affording period products because of their costs. Worker shortages and manufacturing shutdowns have disrupted global supply chains, resulting in shortages of baby formula, popcorn, and now period products. Prices are also rising, with tampons going for as much as $17 a box on Amazon recently. Lack of access to feminine care isn't just a health issue. It can also affect mental and emotional well-being. Young women can't be mentally healthy if they don't have access to food, to housing, and to the supplies that allow them to access school, and that includes period supplies. So it makes sense. It makes sense that this needs to be a part of the mental health conversation. Go With The Flow works with other groups to ensure low-income and unsheltered women also have access to period products. The homeless shelters, domestic violence shelters, food banks, clothing closets. When people think about donating um, hygiene items, they think about things like shampoo, conditioner, toothpaste, uh, toothbrushes, but they don't necessarily think about period products. The shortage is always in existence for folks who particularly are low income and unsheltered. Um, and it's that shortage is not based on a manufacturing issue or a supply issue, it's based on a cost issue. Go With The Flow has events across the Phoenix area to spread awareness about period poverty. To learn how to donate, visit their website at GoWithTheFlowAZ.org. In the newsroom, Milan Andrade, Cronkite News. TikTok has become one of the most downloaded apps of the decade. As Rachel Fortunato found out with over 1.2 billion active users in 2021, it's the perfect place for small businesses to reach potential customers. Jessica Camacho, owner of Decor by Jess, attributes most of her successes to the customers she's reached using the video sharing platform TikTok. I grew a lot, of, a few of my videos went viral, so I think that, that, helped, that helped a lot, TikTok helped a lot. Camacho started her party decorating business at the beginning of the pandemic while people were stuck at home with social media as their only form of human connection. She posted a few videos and one caught fire. First. I would say like month or two, one of my videos got like 50k views, and I like I saw how like how how much of a how much my account grew. So that's when I noticed like oh this this could this could help, and I, that's when I, I became more consistent. Ali Dawalski, co-owner of Jump Into Bliss, found that producing fun content specific to their company connected with customers. So we ended up seeing I think a time lapse someone did. We're like oh that's pretty cool. We can do it with our bounce houses blowing yes. up, and that's what we started. And we just uploaded the time lapse and everyone loved it. TikTok has done a better job at reaching a broad range of age groups. A study shows that the biggest users of TikTok are 20 to 29 years old, making about 35% of their users. Data also shows that older generations are catching on. People turn to social media primarily to connect, to connect with their friends and their family. Um, which from a business standpoint also presents some really unique marketing opportunities. Reports show a majority of businesses use video marketing now. Let's try TikTok. The video seemed fun. There was a lot of cool trends going on at the time. Rachel Fortunato, Cronkite News. TikTok is now in more than 150 markets and continues to grow all across the world. Coming up after the break, we'll give you an update on what the drought has done to Lake Mead. And we'll give you all the details on what that means for us right here in the Valley. Plus, it's the 50th anniversary of Title IX, how the law forever changed women's sports. Lake Mead continues to hit new historic levels, and not in a good way. Water levels at Mead were measured at 1,044 feet yesterday. This puts the reservoir less than 150 feet from Deadpool status. Deadpool status means levels are so low that water can't flow downstream from the Hoover Dam. One University of Arizona professor says he believes that it is still years away. While Deadpool does not mean that there would be no water left, it would be a concern for the production of hydroelectric power. The impacts of Lake Mead reaching that status would be felt across the Southwest. Let's check in with Connor Cox over at the Cronkite Weather Center and see what the forecast has in store for the state. 
Hope you had a doozy of a Thursday, everybody. Let's start off and take a look at the southwestern part of the country and get the big picture of what's coming our way. As you can see here, clouds are being pushed up from northern Mexico and turning into storms before making their way east. Now let's dive into the state. Looks like Sedona should be getting about a bucket of rain right about now, and it should keep coming down tomorrow up north, which is great news for the people battling those two wildfires. Next, let's take a look at highs around the state. 107 in Phoenix, 101 in Tucson, but as you can see, it's cooling down a bit up north and in the southeastern part of the state because of that rainfall. Going into tonight, 100 degrees still at 6 p.m., going down about 6 degrees by 10 p.m. Hopefully, it's going to drop even more throughout the night with scattered showers. Tomorrow, we're going to be kicking off the weekend with 107, but get this. There is going to be multiple days of 20% chance of rain, and that is going to be right in throughout the week, everybody. The triple digits are still here, but hopefully we'll see a little bit of relief. In the Cronkite Weather Center, I'm Connor Cox. I'm Ian Sachs. Coming up after the break, I'll have your Cronkite Sports Report. Will he stay or will he go? Suns players voice support for DeAndre Ayton next. Welcome back to the Cronkite Sports Report. I'm Ian Sachs. 50 years ago today, one law changed women's sports forever. It was a 37-word clause tucked away inside new education legislation. Here's Cronkite News reporter Ashley Stevens on the impact of Title IX. Title IX was written to address gender equality in education, but 50 years later, it may be most known for its impact on women's sports. According to the Women's Sports Foundation, one in 27 girls participated in sports before the passage of Title IX in 1972. Now, that number is two in five. Women's participation in college sports has risen 545% since 1972. At the high school level, only 1% of girls played a varsity sport in 1971. But by 1996, the number rose to 40%. The biggest stride for women came at the 2016 Olympic Games in Rio, where women dominated. U.S. women won 41 medals, 17 gold more than any other nation. But there's still a ways to go. Monetary gaps exist in women's professional basketball and soccer leagues and in the NCAA. And this year marked the first time the NCAA has ever allowed the women's basketball tournament to use the Final Four branding. In the studio, Ashley Stevens, Cronkite News. This year, after a legal battle, the U.S. women's national soccer team and USA Soccer agreed to a landmark deal that equalizes World Cup prize money. In tonight's NBA draft, former Perry High School star Jalen Williams is expected to hear his name called. I spoke with his brother and his high school coach about what it means to have him reach the game's biggest stage. When I was little, I always saw him going to NBA. Like for me, it was never like a question. It's not surprising to me knowing uh, Jalen and how he was in high school. So um, it's just been awesome to watch. Under recruited out of high school, Williams went to Santa Clara, where he was named to the all WCC first team as a junior this season. He averaged 18 points, four rebounds and four assists for the Broncos, all career highs. He's just seeing like firsthand the work that he put in is like, you know, I got to see like experience it you know, right in front of him while he was growing up, all the hard work he put in, so it's just surreal to me. Even though Jalen Williams' career in this Perry gym ended several years ago, when he gets his name called tonight at the NBA draft, it's only further proof to the current team that when they step out of these doors, the opportunities are endless. Jalen kind of set the standard here. He got us to a Final Four. He got us to, to win here. That's been really inspirational. I mean, just shows that, you know, rankings don't really mean anything, you know, because he was, I don't even know if he was ranked coming out of the high school. So then he went to the right place for him. Now he might be a lottery pick. So it's kind of just helped me, you know, think about not worrying about the rankings, just kind of put my head down and works. Cody Williams is now starring at Perry and was an integral part of their state championship this past season. After playing at Section 7 last weekend, he received offers from Arizona and UCLA. Cody will be by Jalen's side tonight in New York when the elder Williams gets his call to the NBA. For most NBA prospects, their dream starts in high school, where players like the Williams brothers try to impress the college scouts. Cronkite
Reporter Ethan Ryder has more on the competitive college recruiting process. The Section 7 tournament in Arizona is one of the top events in the country. From a scouting perspective, it's a chance to see players in a different environment. Kids sometimes look different with their high school team than they do with their club team. So it's, it's great to see them in both settings. Chandler High School coach Jonathan Rother also coaches a club team. He says club games can feel like pickup games, which differs from high school. College coaches and college programs get to see kids play under a certain level of structure that they have in their programs um, that I think sometimes gets lost uh, in club. Five-star Duke commit Jared McCain realizes a tournament like this allows players to show they can execute in different roles. If you play your role the perfect way, then people are going to see it, and they're going to notice that, oh, he's doing little things. He's playing defense really well. He's rebounding. When Corona Centennial guard forward Eric Freeney was given his first college offers at the Section 7 event, the coaches who recruited him told him the simple fundamentals he showed in his high school role was why they made him an offer. Coaches didn't really care about scoring like that. They care about defense and just all the little things like making the right pass, defensive rotations, and getting rebounds and boxing out fundamentals. While club ball showcases raw talent, playing in a more structured high school setting is key for recruiting, and bringing coaches together at Section 7 makes the process easier. In Glendale, Ethan Ryder, Cronkite News. The son DeAndre Ayton knows what it's like to be heavily recruited. The big man was the number one pick in the 2018 draft when the Suns took him out of the University of Arizona. But just four years later, Ayton may be on his way out of Phoenix. Cronkite News reporter Lauren Green talked to Suns players who voiced support for their teammate. Many Suns players showed up for JaVale McGee's softball charity game Wednesday night. And while they were all focused on the fun of the event, talk quickly turned to DeAndre Ayton and whether or not the Suns big man will stay with the team. I feel like he should do what's best for him and his family. Uh, I feel like every NBA player should take that, uh, take that role. Ayton is a restricted free agent, but the Suns can match any offer he gets from another team. There's also been talk of a sign-in trade deal, but players say they're just waiting to see what happens. Control what you can control, you know what I mean? It's summertime, uh, it's a good problem to have, <laughs> if it is a problem. No, we really don't really talk about none of that stuff. We just kind of talk about life and fun. The Suns' early playoff exit sparked talk that Aiton was on the outs with head coach Monty Williams and some of his teammates. But players say they'd love to see Aiton return. Of course, that's my guy, my best friend. Um, Definitely won't want to go nowhere else. From, from my perspective personally, you know, definitely somebody I always want on my team. The Suns did not offer Aiton a max contract deal at the start of last season, possibly signaling the beginning of the end to Aiton's run in the Valley. In Phoenix, Lauren Green, Cronkite News. There are a handful of teams showing interest in Aiton, including the Pistons, Pacers, and Spurs. That's it for today's Cronkite Sports Report. Back to you, Nikita. If you have ever felt the need for speed, you're definitely going to want to stick around. After the break, we head to L.A. to show you how the flight sequences were filmed for the new movie Top Gun Maverick. Top Gun Maverick is skyrocketing at the box office, and according to IMDb, it has grossed over $900 million worldwide since being released at the end of May. Cronkite News reporter Madison Thomas met the aerial coordinator who made this film come to life. The blockbuster film is already one of the most popular movies of the summer. The movie's use of aircraft and aerial scenes sets it apart from other movies. But if you're thinking this was all done through CGI, I talked to someone who will tell you it wasn't. Scenes from Top Gun Maverick like this one look real because it is actually real. One of the people responsible for making this happen is pilot Kevin LaRosa. Know that every time we see a jet or anything, on camera in Top Gun Maverick, there's a real aircraft there. Every time we see a cast member in a cockpit, they are in an F-18 doing those maneuvers. LaRosa is a third generation pilot and second generation aerial coordinator and stunt pilot. He was learning how to fly at an age when you may have been learning how to drive. He grew up following in the footsteps of his idol, his dad. Even if he wasn't my dad, I would look up to this person and go, man, I want to do what he does. Uh, and that gave me this drive in life to do that. Throughout his career, he has worked on films including Transformers The Last Night, The Avengers, and Iron Man. But this one raised the bar. The crew strived for perfection. 
huge testament to Tom Cruise and the Paramount team for going through the expense and the effort to train the cast. Our cast literally basically had to learn how to fly. Uh, we started them into this training program that Tom was uh, driving. The film was originally set to be released a couple years ago, but the COVID-19 pandemic got in the way of that. Larosa says this is a movie that was made to be watched on the big screen with the surround sound. I've sat in movie theaters and I've watched grown men cry. I've watched people spill their popcorn and cheer. That is the best feeling in the world. That's all the crew's blood, sweat, and hard work on the big screen being delivered and people receiving it in the way they are. Larosa says the film has a natural progression and continuously gets more intense. The final sequence of the movie is his favorite. It looked as epic and dynamic and crazy to me sitting in the pilot seat of the camera jet and camera helicopter as it does on the big screen. We talked to LaRosa's dad and he says he could not be more proud than his son. His son has become better than he could ever be. In Los Angeles, Madison Thomas, Cronkite News. That's it for Cronkite News tonight. Thank you for joining us. For top Arizona stories anytime, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org.